day five of the June 99 seven-day retreat in spring water. A couple of days ago in a meeting, someone brought up that their training had been in the midst of whatever goes on in sitting, the thinking, emoting, whatever, to bring the mind back to the breath. And that they found this was a helpful thing. It did, in fact, calm down the turbulent mind. Fewer thoughts. And at the same time, more openness to hearing birds and wind. And yet that this practice seemed to require quite an effort. The effort of shifting from thinking to breath attending. I think most of us here have had some kind of training or other to calm the mind or to concentrate the mind. And we have all experienced, maybe I'm not speaking for everyone, that this takes, requires great effort. I still remember some how many years ago, um, 30, 30 years ago, <clears throat> telling people in what little I talked about retreating, that was the hardest work I'd ever done. I remember saying that. Today it's very difficult to imagine this because it doesn't have this quality of effort, but then it did. I said it, I remember saying it. And of course, people telling me all along, when, when maybe not attending to the breathing, but just attending to everything that goes on in this body, mind, and around one, takes enormous energy. One is dead tired during the day, at the end of the day, from this. I've been reading more and more when in reading some articles about the brain, which always interests me, provided it's not too technical, that the brain requires most of its sugar and oxygen when it pays attention. Interesting corroboration of what we're finding in this work. And one can question as much as I want to well, why make this effort, or why should we make effort? What, we try, what are we trying to get to or accomplish? Attending, giving attention, does take energy. Let's get off of the word effort now and use, rather use the word energy, which can become more complex if there is compulsion in it and wanting to attain goals and feeling failure and success. All of that complicates the matter, but just pure and simple, moving from flowing with thinking, habitual movements, to attending is a shift in energy. From one kind of energy, which is habitual energy, maybe gratifying energy, 
what one fantasizes about, what one would like to have, what one would like to get, what was in the past, or fearful things about what will be in the future, or habitual mulling over of hurtful incidents. It's a habitual energy which is different in quality from simple attending to the breathing, to the birding, to being here. And no need to deny the fact that the habit, the habitual paths is where the mind and body want to abide, to stay, to, to, to remain with. Not to condemn it, to, to become very intimate with this fact that even though some thoughts may be very bothersome, very upsetting, or very gratifying, the mind has gotten used to over its lifetime, or lifetimes, to stay with what is habitual. We've called it the well-oiled paths, to keep rolling on them. And to come to that this is going on, I don't mean in philosophical terms, but involvement in thinking and emoting and angering and upsetting, desiring, to come to, to this fact, seems, at least in the beginning of a who knows how long time, seem like putting the brakes on something that wants to keep moving. And I don't mean brakes that come from the idea this isn't good, I shouldn't be doing this, but just the sheer energetic fact of not moving with the habitual and staying out of it and just listening to what's there, which at this moment may seem very shallow, and no, that's not the right word, very colorless, unexciting, uninviting. Because the body is, body mind are thoroughly addicted to their well-oiled habitual paths of running away from Todd, from yesterday to tomorrow. And waking up to this or coming to is like finding oneself in a stream of strong current and not flowing with it, just stopping for a moment. And as Maybe the, 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 the practice teacher has said, start watching your breathing. Attend to that. It seems to be an effort, because all systems are go with the old, with the habitual. And uh, there's nothing magic or maybe there's everything magic about the breathing. But it's nothing special, it's not a big deal. It's there. It's not thinking. It's not habituating, because breathing is something you can't put your hands on unless you just think I'm breathing. And I think we said last time, one may be told, feel the nostril and feel where this breath goes from the tip of the nose to the bottom of the abdomen, and then one is really locked into a habitual image of what my breathing is like. But that's not attending to breathing. That's knowing something about it, and following a knowing path. And however long it lasts to listen to the breathing, there is inevitably a calming down of the habitual mind. Unless this listening to the breathing is drawn into the habit of I must, I am better, I am worse. 
which can sort of be seen at a glance or little by little and drop away so that there's just the simplicity of one that does not even know what to call, to call it. It's such an amazing thing. And as one person said in the group, if one doesn't, with shoulds and oughts, sort of focus in on the breathing, which makes it sort of loud or gross, I don't know what words were used, in just allowing the breathing to be there, as it is, it becomes maybe even shallow, light, sometimes imperceptible almost imperceptible in this quiet listening, which is a different energy from habiting, moving toward or away from. But maybe in the beginning or however long it takes, it doesn't matter. It seems to be an effort. I mean, we've gone into it to go from what's desired and wanted and known, one is accustomed to it, the, the enormous momentum of it, to not going with that momentum and sitting up, as it were, listening. And beware of the habit wanting to take over that and verbalizing it, making a thing out of it. And not falling for that, that, but it takes a discerning, a subtly discerning mind that doesn't fall for its shenanigans. Let's seize them and let's go of them like poison ivy. Now, the whole question that came up and moved the meeting quite a bit yet the day before yesterday was, in bringing the mind, we'll use the coarse expression right now, in bringing the mind to the breathing, back to the breathing, actually there is no back, every breathing is not back, it's here, now. In attending to the breathing, away from these thoughts that one has momentarily woken up from, become aware of, is there an avoidance? Somebody said, I've done this for years and years and years, holding on to not breathing but koan or whatever the practice may have been, not realizing this enormous power of avoidance by fixating the mind on something that it can deal with and think about or go into koans you don't just think about, enter into it. And the avoidance of one's personal problems, one's angers and fears and depressions, agonies, desire for revenge. So this is the question in sitting here with all manner of thoughts and then getting, uh, coming to and listening to the breathing. Is there a force of avoiding something that threatens to be unpleasant, upsetting? It's not so difficult to discern when that is the case. And one has to be very careful in not judging it, not knowing it, but watching it. Because it can come to a stage in one's meditative living where a thought that may produce anger or upset or fear arises and can be seen at a glance for what it is about to do. Bring up this anger syndrome, bring up this fear, agony, the fear network. 
and see, see at a glance this whole thing which the mind is about to enter into and not enter into it right then and there, which is not, I would not call that avoidance or denial. I would call that intelligence. <laughs> which is in a glimpse of awareness that it is full of intelligence. Awareness is intelligent in seeing what contracts, what gets away from awareness. It can see that, what is about to darken, make make hard, make angry, make fearful. Now, it's not just a glimpse of awareness, there's quite some stability to this awareness which sees at a glance what thoughts are coming up, seductive, habitual, and what they're about to, to do, like a spider web thrown over the whole clear field. It's more than a spider web. Spider web is still transparent. A lot of light comes through. But these anger or fear networks don't let much light through. So that's the best of all cases, the seeing what this is all about, one is about to get into and not and staying with awareness, staying with, then one doesn't have to attach to the breathing. It's there and it's beautiful, freeing, wholesome ways. So, but let us say, stable awareness or not, something has upset one. Yesterday, a moment ago, as, it, as the memory comes up. And one can feel the mind wants to go to that to, to lay it bare, to sort of figure it out, sort it out. What, was go what happened there? And to, to really go with it, with this need to clarify this upset. Not to make short shrift of that and say, oh, this is getting away from my pure mind. I need to go back to my practice. And all of these kind of ideas, go with it if, if this is the urgency. One can tell when the mind returns, keeps returning to it and it doesn't allow itself to do it for all kinds of ideas of what meditation should be like. But to use the quietness and the energy of meditation to sort out what happened or what is happening right now, which amazingly will bring up some very good questions. Why did I get upset? Or why am I so anxious? And one question leads to another. It's not so much psychoanalytical. It is, it is coming up out of this inquiry of wanting to get to the, not just to the bottom, first through this, virvau is the German word, what is this, confusion of emotions and feelings and headlines which incite more emotions. To try to understand it, throw light on it. And it may take a lot of questioning verbally, sometimes not verbally, and Answers coming up verbally. Yes, it's because of this or that. And then listening to those quote-unquote answers and saying, wait a minute, is this, is this all? Is this really so? And giving it time, like that little muddy pond, give it time to settle out some. Maybe what will come up is, no, this wasn't the whole of it. There is something deeper to this upset and allowing oneself to sink deeper with the question and the looking. No matter 
how much time it takes, it doesn't matter. Actually, the sinking deeper and looking has no time. It happens now. Maybe the question comes up, all right, I understand better how I feel and why I feel and what keeps this whole thing going. But maybe the space is there to wonder, how did the other people feel? Not out of just trying to be compassionate, but an interest. What was going on for them? And maybe it's not possible, it was too long ago. Or, but sometimes amazing revelations come if it's possible to enter into somebody else's situation and position and personality. looking through their eyes and confused mind, which is also our confused mind. So, with, with this kind of working, if you will, which allows itself to be spontaneously led by questions that pop up and silent looking and listening, engaging in this at times when the need arises, one may find that the mind turns less and less to this so-called problem, to this so-called memory or situation. It sort of is as though it has dealt with it. It doesn't need to rummage around in it. Or less. Uh, it loses its automatic, robotic way of churning because it has been given attention and insight and a widening and broadening and lightening up. Not that this will relieve the mind of worrying about things, because there's always something new coming up. The old one is settled, something new comes up. Some new imbalance, somebody called it. The mind constantly teetering from balance to imbalance, and trying to restore balance, and there is the new imbalance already. Hardly restored, the old balance. And, as one, one finds with observation and understanding, learning, this brain wants to establish order. It really, deep down, doesn't like to be upset, even though it can get addicted to certain ways of thinking and obsessing. But at least this is my experience more and more the longer I'm engaged in this work, that this brain wants order. Order and, the words came up, goodwill for all, toward all. To embrace everyone in this order of living together. So when, uh, when it wakes up at night, it almost never fails at first, a moment of waking up and feeling how tired one is, and then what is out of order? <laughs> is there something <laughs> that is awry, which is not conducive to sleeping? <laughs> Because with going into the Arianus, picturing it, remembering it, the, the system is all go to, to do, to examine. I mentioned to, to the group in which we were discussing, uh, watching the breathing, that I'm very happy with a breathing exercise at those times. Knowing full well how this body-mind needs 
certain hours of sleep or a certain amount of sleep in order to function well in the, in the daytime. It's not so much do you desire to fall asleep. It's, it's much simpler. It's understanding what is helpful, healthful, and seeing whether one can bring it about and finding this a way of breathing in the way I found I breathe when I wake up from deep sleep. It's not the same breathing as I breathe when going to sleep. It's a different rhythm. It's an amazing and helpful discovery. And uh, how do you say? Intentionally, deliberately, bringing on this breathing, uh, doing, going into this breathing, which at first doesn't seem that that's what one wants to do because one is awake, but going with it and attending to it, and it's much easier to fall asleep again and not go into this order making of things that happen around one and in one during nighttime. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But again, it is not, even though it's a really a paying attention to this rhythm and to the breathing, I, I would never call it an escape. It's getting sleep that is needed. And one feels, when one has slept, how, how well one is upon waking up. Given the brain some break. Just remember a thing that happened this morning on the walk up the hill. You know, there was good energy from the cool, crisp air. The colors are so different and beautiful when the clouds are covering the sky. Very intense, greens everywhere walking along up the Northwestern Trail and noticing the tiredness in the legs and approaching this lovely red and blue path going off to the right before you come to the summit of our land there on the Northwestern Path. I love this trail. We haven't had it too long. It's a, a different experience of the woods and soggy places. Right now they're almost dried out, not quite. You can still put your foot into it. Slip off that shaky bridge there. It would be nice to have a little bit of better one there. <laughs> have you slipped off of it too? <laughs> so, really wanting to go on that path and also that is the end of the uphill and it's downhill all the way. And then a thought occurring in the mind, these legs are really getting quite weak. I haven't done much walking. It's the first sort of systematic or sustained walking here in a long time, in many weeks, in this retreat. And, and then the thought, if you walked up the remaining path to the summit, these legs will get stronger, which they have in other retreats. And, doing this in on periods, walking once a day up this path. And then the thought, well, you get very sweaty from walking up and then you may have to change your clothes. 
and then looking on the watch, it was plenty of time to change clothes, if I had to. And the legs kept going uphill. Because this made sense, apparently. Keep going up even, in spite of all the ifs and buts, the attraction of the other path. And this one is beautiful too. There is nothing on this land that isn't beautiful. But again, I was thinking how much often we belabor. Is there free will? Is there choice? Isn't there choice? And the best way to solve this seemingly endless problem is to watch it. How is it when a, a path forks? There's a choice seemingly to take this or that and to watch what goes on. The thoughts with their pictures, you see the one path, you see the other, the remembrances, sweating, so forth, to see to see what goes on and then something happens. One either takes the path to the right or goes straight ahead. After something, something in the brain is discerning. Or, uh, I don't know what it is. I haven't solved this to put it into proper words. And because we have no proper words, we say it's me deciding. But that's too coarse. That's not, I don't find a me there, I just find uh, possibilities, options uh, spreading themselves out with their advantages and disadvantages and going for one. Walk, walk, walk. It's such a beautiful way. We can avoid all arguments, which we inevitably get into because we're nurtured in them and they're all around us. If we say, okay, let's watch it. And that then one may find at the crucial times we're not watching, we're engaged in fantasy or whatever. And then we watch that or become aware of that at one point or another. It comes with this work. It inevitably comes to wake up more and, and see what is happening for however brief this opening window may be and learning something. With airplanes buzzing and birds chirping. No, no one there to behold it all. We will end here for today.